All right, well, good morning. It's really good to see you all this morning. If, uh, if you're new with us, I just want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at some of you out of the three of us, uh, Mike and Doug. And I think Mike is on a um, much-needed small group camping trip or something like that. And so that's fun. And um, Doug, obviously, is going to be teaching on the west side tonight. Uh, but today is Valentine's Day. And I'm not talking about it at all. <laughs> so, if anything, I guess in some way we're talking about relationship because we're talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and God and the, the messed up relationship that exists there. Hopefully you're, if you have a significant other that you're going to have Valentine's Day with today, hopefully your relationship is a little healthier than what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, but that's about as close to Valentine's Day as we're going to get. Um, let's pray together. And we will jump into Romans chapter 2 together. Father, I really just want you to be here. I want for you to overcome the fact that I am a man who is weak and sinful. A man who... uh, Honestly, has nothing much to say outside of your word. I, I pray, God, that you would be the one preaching this morning. I ask, God, that you would come in power. That your word would pierce us in our hearts. That our desire to, to try and earn our salvation or any desire that we have to try to gain favor with you by what we do, Lord, that you would put a stop to that. And Lord, that you would help us in hearing your word this morning to submit to you as our God, as our Lord, as our King, to love you as our Savior and our friend, and to trust you as our Counselor. Lord, I thank you that we can gather here together and worship you. And I pray that we would do so. I pray that we wouldn't just show up because that's not worship. I pray that we wouldn't just hear and then walk away and not do anything with what we hear because that's not worship either. Help us to love you and to appreciate you and to have joy in you and to be found in you. Lord, we love you. We want to love you more and love your word more. So help us as we gather this morning to do that. Incline our hearts to hear your wonderful good news, too. Amen. If you guys can, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Romans 2. If you are using one of the uh, house Bibles, it's going to be on page 1, or sorry, 140, if only Romans were that early in the Bible, 940. And uh, basically, we're looking at Romans 2, 12 through 16, which is a continuation of Paul's arguments kind of streaming from the end of chapter 1, moving through the beginning of chapter 2, and up to where we are now. So to make sense of what we're going to read today, we need to remind ourselves of where we just were. So um, we're going to kind of go back a week or two here. Because remember, it would have been really easy for the Jew at the time to read about all the horrible things that mankind does in the end of chapter 1. You know, they were given all sorts of lusts and all these types of things. They would have looked at that and said, oh yeah, the Gentiles are just animals, but we're the Jews. We have the laws. So remember, there was a a clear distinction. There's Jews and there's everybody else. There's Jews and there's everyone else. So it would have been real easy for them to feel nothing but contempt for the Gentiles after reading Paul's analysis of them at the end of chapter 1. And so what I want to do is look back at the beginning of chapter 2, and we're just going to kind of look at that and then move into where we're going today. So let's read this together, starting in verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man. He's speaking to the Jew here. Every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 
But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace from everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So let's just do a really quick recap here, starting with verse 1. So the Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you judges. So the Jews were judging the Gentiles from a place of self-righteousness, even though we know by looking at the Old Testament that the Jews were not really righteous. They committed all sorts of various sins, all sorts of various types of evil, and so they're, they're putting themselves in this place that they shouldn't be putting themselves in. And then in verse 4, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The Jews were expecting that they would be just fine because they had the law. We're Jews. Everything is going to be just fine because we're Jews. That's, that's what they were banking on. They had experienced God, God's kindness, his forbearance, his patience. We can see that throughout the Old Testament. The, the Old Testament, experienced, they'd experienced that from God. But instead of repenting, of their sin, they became more entitled and even more self-righteous. And Paul continues on, then, because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. So, according to Paul, the Jews could not use anything like their nationality or their religiosity or anything like that to save themselves because their hearts were hard and they were actually sinning against God even though they thought they were doing all the right things. And so just like Gentiles, as much as the Jews wouldn't have wanted to hear this, it would have been really offensive to them, just like the Gentiles, they too would face God's wrath, if not repentant. And then he lists two types of people. You know, he will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and while doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and so on. So we have two types of people. And in our world, there really are only two types of people. God will render payment, if you will, to these two types of people. And that payment will be based on how they lived. So in verse 7, we see people that live their lives for God and not for themselves. They live for a future glory, a future honor, an eternal life with God. That's what they're looking for. That's what the righteous are doing is they're hoping in God. And in verse 8, we see the other type of person that lives their lives for themselves. If you live for yourself, you cannot live for God. If you are self-seeking, you cannot be God-seeking. It's either Him or you. Now these two people stand on opposite ends of the spectrum from one another, and in verse 9 and 10, we see the payment rendered to these two people. So there's tribulation and distress for all those who do evil. And that's a life of self-service and disobedience to the truth. But then there's glory and honor and peace for all who do good. Because they are patient and well-doing and seeking after, the, after eternity with God. And so, again, I'm just trying to run through this real quick. But what we see in these verses is the beginning of Paul's argument. <clears throat> Excuse me. The beginning of Paul's argument against the Jewish people and their attitude of self-righteousness. This is really important to get. Okay, this is, this is an argument that he's starting. He's going to continue it even past what we're talking about today. But in addition, we can clearly see that being a Jew or a Gentile, which by the way, just to reiterate this in case no one's heard me say it before, if you have no Jewish lineage, you are a Gentile, okay? So that's you if you're not familiar with that term. But it makes no difference if you're a Jew or a Gentile in regards to salvation. There is no partiality, as verse 11 says, with God. What really matters to God is the heart. 
What really matters to God is the heart and whether or not a person embraces sin or runs from it. And we need to think about that as we move on. So let's just move on to verse 12. This is what we're talking about this morning. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So verse 12, again, is contrasting two people. Those without the written law, and those that have the written law. So it's the Gentile and the Jew. Those are the two contrasting people that we have here. So, are the Gentiles in a better place than the Jews because they don't have the standard of the law to live up to? Are they, are they free from the penalty of sin because they don't have the written law telling them to live otherwise? It's a really important question. And the answer is no. <laughs> because ignorance to the law does not save you if you break the law. Let me give you an example. Has anyone ever been pulled over for speeding? I'm pretty sure most of you have. If it's in a school zone, you especially feel bad. Probably not because you could have killed a kid, but because it's more money. But all that aside, all that aside, say you drive over the speed limit, and you get pulled over, and the officer says, do you realize how fast you were going? And you say, you know, I didn't see a speed limit sign. So I don't know what it was. And he says, well... Here's your ticket. <laughs> Pay better attention next time. Your ignorance to the law did not save you from the penalty that came from breaking it. Just like the Gentiles here, okay? Similarly, the Jews are not safe just by having the written law, as they would have thought that they were. Knowing the law does not save you if you break it. So what if you saw that it was 30 miles per hour? If you drove 40... You can't say, well, I knew, I knew, you know, Mr. Officer Guy, that I knew that it was, that it was 30, but I drove 40. He's going to say, yeah, here's your ticket. <laughs> What's wrong with you? If you knew, you're even held to a higher account than the dumb guy who didn't know. What's wrong with you? And so the Jews who thought, well, we have the law, they thought they were safe. They're, they're not safe, just like the Gentiles are not, just without the law. So in these verses, Paul shows that whether you're ignorant of the law or know the law, you will still face the same judge and the same consequence for breaking that law. There's no difference. Salvation is not found in having or lacking the written law. What matters is that you sinned against God. And we all do that, regardless of what we know or what we don't know. And this is the partiality of God that we talked about in verse 11. Paul wants both groups here to know that they are sinners. He wants us to know that we have sinned against God and will be condemned according to those works. In other words, the law is like a, a school teacher in a sense, revealing our sin. But the law can't actually save us from that sin. It just reveals it to us. It reveals how bad we are. It reveals how messed up we are. That's the purpose of the law. It's teaching us, wow, we, we need this, but we can't look to the school teacher to save us. And the Gentiles didn't necessarily care. They didn't really care about the law because they didn't have it. And the Jews put too much stock into it. So you see how you've got these two polar opposites, but they're both held to the same account before God. And the Jews would be wrong about thinking that they, you know, you can see it in the Pharisees and Sadducees and all those people when you read the New Testament. You can see just by having the law, they think they're super special. They're just really great. Like, hey, God loves me just because I have the law. And they couldn't be more wrong. Verse, four, verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So, hearing is not enough to be righteous. Just hearing the law is not enough to be righteous. A Jew at that time could easily walk to the synagogue or walk anywhere else and hear teaching and walk away completely unaffected. Kind of sounds familiar. 
We, we struggle with the same things. But the Jew will walk to the synagogue, they'll hear all these things, and they'll walk away unaffected and unchanged. Now there's an expectation that when we hear truth, the expectation is that it will change us, it will affect us, it will change how we live. And we should do something with what we hear. How well are you going to do in school or at your job if the person in authority says to you, you need to do such and such a way, and you walk away and you don't do any of those things? You're going to get fired. You're going to get kicked out of school, whatever. But there is an, F, an element of the fact that there is a doing that takes place. Just hearing is not enough. There is a doing that has to take place. And we see this in James 1, 22 through 24. You're all familiar with this passage. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. This is just a really funny statement when you think about it. When you look at yourself in the mirror, how many of you look at yourself and walk away and say, wow, I don't remember what I looked like. What do I look like? Wait, I better go back to the mirror and check. And then you run back and you're like, oh yeah, I have a beard. Hopefully if you're a woman you don't say that. But, <laughs> but I say that. You know, oh, I'm wearing glasses today. You know, you, you, it's ridiculous. Who does that? All of us are probably more painfully aware of what we look like than anything. And so James is pointing out here, listen, if you hear something, that's like looking, that's that example. It's like looking in the mirror and forgetting what you looked like a second later and having to keep going back. And that's not how we were meant to live. Living out what we receive is of the utmost importance. We cannot expect that we will live lives of righteousness being justified on the final day if we simply hear and never put any of that stuff into practice. We can't just expect that that's going to work that way. So then is Paul saying that we're justified by works? Is that what this verse is saying? That is this some sort of works-based salvation? That's an important question. And the answer to that is also no. <laughs> we have to view this statement in context of Paul's entire argument, of his entire theme that he has here. And the theme that he's covering is not salvation. The theme that he's covering is law, sin, and judgment. That's what he's talking about here. That's the nail that he's going to continue to hit. And he's trying to make a point to his audience that they cannot, whether Jew or Gentile, they cannot be justified by our works. So how does, how does this verse say that when it seems the opposite? When we look at it, we say it says you're justified by what you do. So how am I coming up with that? Well, based on the theme. Because they would have viewed themselves as doing well because of all the things they did. You know, you can think of the, like the leaders in the New Testament when the, there was the one Jewish leader who said, you know, I fast twice a week and I'm really great. And, you know, and they wore their phylacteries large and all these types of things. You see that about the Jews. It's very outward appearance. They're trying to show off their religiosity and all the things they can do. They consider themselves righteous because of those things. But Paul here sneaks in something. And I didn't even notice it until, uh, to be frank, Martin Lloyd-Jones pointed it out to me. <laughs> And this is a wonderful, wonderful argument because he proves them wrong right here. This, this statement is a true statement, okay? Hearers of the law, that's not enough, and doers will be justified. That's actually a true statement. But who has ever done the law to perfection? Who has ever kept the law perfectly? No one. Not a single person. Even if they were to boast in keeping most of the law. We know from James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point is accountable for all of it. Or as other translations says, guilty of breaking all of it. You fall on just one point. So while the statement is true that hearing is not enough and that doers of the law will be justified, no one can do this. And no one has ever done this other than Jesus. 
He fulfilled the law in his life, which it is only, and so if he fulfilled it, he's the only one that, that can give us that justification. So when Paul writes this, this section is about judgment, which will occur on the final day. That's the justification. The justification here is our final justification that will be declared to all when we stand in judgment. This isn't the justification of like, hey, you're, this is, you've been just, you've been made just, you're saved. This is like everything has come to completion. Everything's come to completion. You will be justified on the last day. And it's all because of Jesus, because nobody, no Jew, no Gentile, can live enough according to the law to actually save themselves. So when he makes that statement, when he makes that statement, the doers of the law will be justified, that's true, but no one can do it. So do you see how that, in a sneaky way, kind of shows the Jews, listen, you think, you think that you can and what's really sad, brothers and sisters, is that we think that we can. We, we function as legalists. We function as people who, oh, I messed up and I sinned against this holy God, and now I've got to make up for it. Now I've got to whip myself, beat myself in, in all sorts of ways. I've got to make myself feel really, really bad. And Jesus says, you know, didn't I do enough on the cross? <laughs> when I took that, was I not your justification? We say, yeah, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, but then we go back to, no, I have to make up for this, I have to, and that is, that's just adding fuel to the fire. And that's what the Jews were guilty of doing. They just, they weren't really repenting, they weren't really hearing what God had done through the Messiah. And so, brothers and sisters, we as Christians now, we see a lot of the whole picture here, we must trust in the only one who can give us justification. We must. And even though Paul isn't mentioning all this yet, I just thought I would mention it because I didn't want anyone to get worried or confused or think, okay, it's as doers of the law will just be justified. Because to be frank, you know, a lot of us are not very patient. <laughs> and so when we hear things like, go do something, we can do it in all sorts of wrong ways. When really we need to process it and think, okay, what does it mean to do and not try to do for the sake of earning? salvation. So anyway, moving on, verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So the Gentiles are to show, are, are shown here to be very similar, to be in a very similar place to where the Jews are, even though they were never given the written law. So the Gentiles live according to a law as well. And we see this because we can see that even today, people who have no concept of the law, or no concept of what God would want, we still all have you know, moral judgments and, and things like that. You can kind of see that in the world. So the Gentiles show that they are still accountable to God in regards to their sin because of what Paul lists in verse 15 here. So the work of the law is written on their hearts. The work of the law is written on the Gentiles' hearts. Now this is really important. This is not the law itself. It's the work of the law. Think of it more as like law residue. <laughs> okay? It's kind of like the law already is there, but they don't really get it. It's kind of a, a, almost a natural thing. Now why do I say this? Because if it were the law itself, and not just the works of the law, the Gentiles would have something that the Jews never had. The Jews... The Jews received the written physical law. They never actually received this internally. It says the Gentiles have. We have no scripture to, to say that they have. But the work of the law is written on the Gentiles' hearts. The Gentiles would not have had a privilege over the Jews according to the, our understanding of the Old Testament. They just wouldn't. And so, we know that the work of the law is written on their hearts. It's ethical requirements, basic moral values. We see that all over in today with people who don't believe God. But in addition to this, their conscience bears witness to what is right and wrong. Now, all men and women have a conscience. You, you all have a conscience. It's that little voice in your head that nags at you when you're about to do something bad, <laughs> when you're about to do something wrong. And we all feel it very profoundly. There's not a person in here who hasn't been about to do something really dumb, whether they were saved or saved, who doesn't hear this little nagging, no, what are you thinking? Don't, 
Don't do that. And every person has a conscience. Every person has that. Now, not all consciences are created equal. Okay? Some are a little more mature than others. Some are are a little more uh, healthy than others because there are people that still have a conscience and still kill other people and things like that. But, But the conscience does exist. And it's there for people in the same way that the Jews had the written law kind of nagging at them. Now the conscience is a powerful thing and we should heed it. And just one example of this is, you know, Martin Luther, when he was on trial at the Diet of of, of Worms, he said said to the Catholic Church, so they were telling him, hey, you need to recant for all your false teaching. And this is what Martin Martin Luther says. I think I have it up here for you guys. But he says, since your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without... (laughs) <laughs> horns and without teeth, which I just love that, by the way, because if you know anything about Martin Luther, you know how feisty he was. Like, he's just insulting on a certain level just because he was so blunt. So I just love that he was trying to be polite here and not his typical self. Unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. So he heard his conscience was very firm on, hey, to go against what I'm believing about, my conscience is, now pay attention, his conscience, he says, was held captive to what? To his own prerogative? No, to the word of God. So he was basing that, his his conscience was coming from that. But even in the sense of an unbeliever, we all have a conscience. And this leads to the final point, which is that they have conflicting thoughts over what's right right, right or wrong. And this wouldn't happen if mankind didn't have some sort of uh, law, some sort of general morality guiding them. That's not necessarily the written law. And you guys have all seen this. I don't need to go into examples of this, but where people argue over what's right or wrong, and you say, well, what's your moral value for doing that? And they're like, eh, just kind of the general consensus. Why do you think it's wrong to murder all these people, you know, when you don't believe there's a God or anything? Well, that's just the general consensus. Based off of what? Oh, it's just the general, it's just the law, you know, it's just what we believe. That's what the law says, you shouldn't kill people. Everybody has this. It's just kind of this understanding. Maybe that's because we were all made in the image of God. And in being image bearers, we all have this almost imprinting of what is right and wrong. And so the Jews had the law, the Gentiles have this. And again, this is all part of the argument that none of us, Jew or Gentile, is without excuse before a holy God in regard to our sin. And that all of us, whether in knowledge or ignorance, would stand condemned before God before the Lord because of sin. That, that's just the truth. And that has to hit home. I mean, this, this is really important, that we all would stand condemned before God because of our sin. And our works cannot save us. Paul's just really hitting that nail. And he continues it. <clears throat> For all, so we're going to go to verse 16 here, which is the end here. But kind of what we had looked at is kind of parenthetical. So when you look at verse 12, think of verse 12 connecting with verse 16, okay? That's how it makes the most sense. So I'm just going to read it. I don't have it up there for you, but just, I mean, we've got the whole section up there. But just read it this way. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ. Jesus. Now I want to just take a real brief moment here to talk about kind of Paul's wording here. Because this can throw some people off and you get all sorts of crazy things coming out of the church. But when Paul's saying my gospel, he, what Paul's stating is not his own gospel, something he's created. This is the gospel that he's been given as an apostle to proclaim. This is that gospel. It's not as if we can all take our, you know, we, we all have our own gospel that we take based off of experience. Like, hey, 
This is what I've experienced, so this is my gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And I just, I've read countless articles over the past months to years, to a year, frankly, about how you know, Christianity is in culture and how all that looks and just how ridiculous it is that so many Christians have abandoned the Bible and have totally given themselves over to experience and made that their gospel. It is just mind-boggling to me. And I don't even know if you can call them Christians anymore because they don't really believe the gospel. They've created their own. But that's not what Paul's doing here. He's saying, according to my gospel and according to his gospel which is the one gospel of Jesus Christ, a day of judgment is coming. And that day of judgment is as much a part of the good news as our salvation is. Brothers and sisters, there is a day coming. And I really don't want to gloss over this. Um, there is a day. We have to feel this. I, I, just, I get so frustrated because so many times we can just skirt over things and skim over things. We cannot skim over this. There is a day coming when God will judge all men. And all these people who think that they're living just good enough lives or all these people who think that they're doing this good thing and that good thing who think, oh, I'm going to stand before God and he's going to say, yeah, you did enough good things. Come on in. Those people will be told, I never knew you and we just skim over it like it's nothing. We cannot do that. We cannot, guys. We have to take this seriously. Jesus is going to judge the world. He's going to judge the world based off of public actions and what it says here also is our hidden life. The secrets of men will be judged by Christ Jesus. Now we think that no one can see what we try to keep so hidden. We think that no one can see it. But that's not true. Others may not see it. I, I honestly, you know, it's like has anyone over the years, you know, if you grew up in like say, I'm going to you know, show my age a little bit, but if you grew up in like the 80s and 90s and, you're, and you're, you're watching all this stuff, I know that's not old and some of you are saying 80s and 90s showing your age, what are you talking about? Just forgive me for that and hear me out. You can use it of any age, but think about this for a second. Has it bothered anyone in the age of the internet? Has this driven any of you crazy that you've had all these heroes growing up? And now the internet has, you have Wikipedia and all these things, and you see, oh, the guy who hosted that kid's show was a child molester. Oh, the person who did these great things cheated on his wife. Oh, the person who did these great things, and you, it's almost like, I'm thankful for it, because it removes hero worship from my life. <laughs> but at the same time, it hurts, because you've looked at these people or you looked at these things that you valued and you say, yeah, this is wonderful. And then it was shown to be not true. And so when I look at this room, I see a bunch of people that I know. But I also know, if you're anything like me, that I really don't know your hidden sins, your secret thoughts, the things that would ruin your reputation if it came out. We all have those. And, and for some of us, it eats us up. We, we lose sleep over it. But we, we, we just hold on to habitual sin because it, we're really falling into the tragedy of the Jews. We're not repenting. We're not falling before God and saying, no, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Help me to not do this anymore. We, we all have this secret life in, in one sense or another. Some of, you, some of you may, and you're growing to know the Lord over the years, have had success in, in squashing that. And maybe your secret life isn't as profound as others. But I think we all have little things that we try to hide. And so I do want to ask you, just be honest with, your, with yourself. Are there secret sins in your life that nobody knows about and that you don't want other people to know about? Maybe you're sleeping with your boyfriend. Maybe you're sleeping with your girlfriend. Maybe, you know, you show up to church and you, you just... Who knows what happened the morning of or the night, the night before or whatever else. And you just put on the happy Christian face and everything's great. And yeah, hey, let's worship Jesus when inside you are dying because of these secrets you're trying to keep. If there's, I mean, this is ample proof of why our works, our public efforts can't save us. 
because there's enough inside of us to condemn us to hell forever. So all the things you could, you know, it's the, all, our, all our righteous works are like filthy rags, right? They look good on the outside, but they're actually pretty dirty. And if, there's ever, if there was ever any doubt, brothers and sisters, that salvation is in Christ alone, and that it can only be in Him alone, we should lose that doubt here. This is, it is about Him. We only have hope in Him. You know, you think of uh, the talks of trying to maintain some sort of church exterior, some sort of sinless exterior. That's just falling into the same trap of the Pharisees. You remember what they were called? Whitewashed tombs. Woe to us if we ever would be whitewashed tombs. I mean, goodness, what a horrible church we would be. That would just be horrible. We're going to shipwreck our church. Everything's going to fall apart if on the outside we've washed ourselves white as snow to look really good for everybody else when on the inside we are covering up so many sins that we just don't want to tell anyone because we don't want to ruin our reputation. It's really dangerous. Again, our only hope is Christ. He's the only person that lived up to this standard. He really has done it. So, to end here, perhaps you think of yourself as the Jew would have. You know, I grew up in a Christian family, so I'm all good. My parents were Christians, so that must mean I'm all good, right? Listen, if you're a kid, if you, whether teenager, young kid, whatever, the fact that your parents are saved does not mean that you are. Okay? Just because your parents know Christ does not mean that you can just ride it out because your parents had faith. It also doesn't mean that if you're a teenager or whatever, that just by imitating your parents' faith, that you actually have saving faith in Jesus Christ. It has to be your own decision. It has to be in your own heart, in your own mind, your own desire. It cannot be just, hey, I'm living off of you know, other people's Faith, other people's glorifying God. And we, we all fall into that in some, for, in some way, shape, or form. But saying, I grew up in a Christian family, does nothing for you before God. So what? Wasn't there some sort of covenant, you know, passing down generations, all that stuff? Yeah, but not a salvation one. Everyone, everyone needs to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Just because your parents did it doesn't mean that you have it. And I just want to be really clear on that because I've known far too many kids who have grown up in the church and have never embraced how wonderful it is to know Jesus Christ as their own Savior and they've just, they just followed their parents and think, oh, this is all good. No, recognize, you know, young guys, young girls, recognize that you need a Savior in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Him, it doesn't matter what your parents believe. It's on you, not on them. So that's one thing. Maybe you're like the Jew and you say, oh, I go to church every week. What is the G.K. Chesterton quote? Going, you know, um, oh, I'm going to mess this up. And he's so perfect in his quotes that I don't want to mess it up. Let me think here. Um, Being in a church makes you no more of a Christian than standing in a garage makes you a car. Isn't that an interesting quote? Just coming every week doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Just showing up and doing the stuff doesn't automatically make you saved. So, for those of you who come every week and you think, okay, I'm just putting in my quota, just stop that, please. Show up to worship Jesus. Because it, it's not about that. It's, we cannot live just, oh, well, I go to church every week, and so I'm good. No, you're not good. <laughs> you're self-righteous. <laughs> because you're putting it all on you and your, your ability to, to perform. Maybe you say, oh, I, I tithe and I pray and I, I fast and I read my Bible every day and, and I do all these things. Well, you sound just like that Pharisee. You know, I fast twice a week. I'm better than everybody else because look at all the great things that I can do. Now, you may not think of it that way, but in a sense, you're boasting in your self, and that's not going to help you either. Maybe it's, I'm a decent human being. I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen anything more than a pen from my job. I'm a pretty decent guy or girl. Come on. I love people. I hug people when I see them. I'm great. Okay. 
Do I need to explain this? That's ridiculous. Your decency in the face of God's righteousness is just not even... It, it's, it's pointless. <laughs> your decency will not save you. How about, well, I live in a Christian nation. Okay, Christian nation. Let's just put that in quotes forever. Okay, and stop allowing whoever it is in politics to make us believe that we are part of some sort of Christian nation, okay? Look at our nation. Where's the Christian fruit? Where is it? Killing millions of babies a year, right? We're allowing all sorts of things that Paul talks about in Romans 1 to happen. It's just, yeah, hey, that's what the U.S. is about. Freedom. Give me my rights. It's not a Christian nation, so... If you're saying, well, I'm part of America, I, you know, this is a Christian nation. Even if you go so far as to say, we're God's chosen people, which is ridiculous, but, you know, if, almost as if America's the new Israel or something like that, okay? Listen, just because something bad is happening in America doesn't mean the end is coming. That drives me crazy more than anything as people say, oh, things are happening really bad in America. That must mean Jesus is coming back. No. What's happening in America is bad, but not in... I mean, think of the world. There's a lot of bad stuff. I'm getting on way tangent. But seriously, seriously here, it just drives me crazy. The whole idea of I am, I'm an American, I live in a Christian nation, I must be special, it's, it's ridiculous. It won't take you anywhere. How about I study and read books by dead theologians who are much smarter than I am and everybody else. And because I read... You know, Richard Baxter and John Piper and John MacArthur and Tim Keller. And because I, you know, read uh, the Puritans and all these stuff, I must be saved. I tell you what, you can be a scholar of the Bible and not know Christ. You can know the Puritans and, and, and enjoy them and all that kind of stuff and just and read it and, and walk away with no relationship with Jesus Christ or one that is not really even you know, growing in any way. So don't say, because I've got, you know, you go home and you look at your bookshelf and you say, what a great bookshelf. I'm, you know, look at all the wonderful things I read. There's nothing bad up here. There's no Rob Bell up here. There's no Joel Osteen on this shelf. Look at me. And I'm, I'm talking about myself here. Because you can fall into this trap, right? You start getting all the right books, watching all the right people, listening to all the right sermons, and before you know it, you say, you know, I don't know about that book because it's not written by one of these heavy hitters. Self-righteousness in disguise. Be very, very careful. Those guys are all good, by the way. My bookshelf's full of them. But be very, very careful that you are not looking at yourself and saying, I'm better than all these other people like the Jews did because I'm reading all the right things. Be really careful, you guys. So yeah, if you're relying on any of these things for security from God in regards to being saved from His wrath, look elsewhere. <laughs> Those things will not save you. And don't use them to think of yourself higher than others as excuse me, the Jews did with the Gentiles. What we all need to do, myself included, is humble ourselves and quit trying to be our own self-righteous saviors. Humble yourself and just ask Him to please help me to not live this way. So if anything, we've seen today that Paul is convinced, and this is really important, Paul is convinced that all people stand condemned before a holy God because of our sin. The things that we do in this world, we all stand condemned before a holy God. And we all deserve His wrath. And we really have to get this, guys, if we're going to understand why the good news is so good. Jesus didn't just save you so that you could feel all therapeutic and wonderful and wow, you know, like a spiritual... Renewal of some, like you, you went to the you know, salon and got your hair done or something. And wow, I just feel so much better. It's not about therapy. It's not about, you know, prosperity. It's none of those things. Jesus came to save you from what is killing you. What will send you to an eternal hell. 
He came to save you from his wrath, from the penalty of sin. He came to save you from self-righteousness, from blaming, you know, from, from feeling blame and, and, and just feeling totally burdened all the time with your sin. He came to save you from that. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that the most amazing thing? <laughs> you can find, you can find hope and joy in psychology and science and all these other things. But you can't find true salvation there. Because none of those things save you from the wrath of God. So I just really, I, I, we have to get this. We have to get that this is a part of the gospel. We, we can put our faith in Jesus and trust that he was this perfect fulfiller of the law. We can do that. And that he was a perfect sacrifice for sin. We can have hope in our condemnation. So for those of you who feel in this moment like, man, I just am a mess. I'm a horrible sinner. Turn to Christ. <laughs> I have nothing better to say to you than that. Turn to Jesus Christ. Don't allow those things to crush you. Don't allow those things to crush you. We can have hope from our condemnation because he is our Savior and Lord. So what I want us to do now is I just want us to pray. And first I want you to praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise Him. How, how many of you actually praise God? When, when, I, when I say, hey, we should pray and praise God. Like yesterday, I was at my son's basketball game. And you guys know I'm not the biggest sports person in the room. I've made enough comment about the Broncos and football for you to know that. But yesterday, I was at my son's game. And it was like 11 to 11, you know. They're like almost, who's going to win? And he's nine, you know. And all the parents are... Yeah, go, go, go. Come on, get that, you know, 30 seconds. Everybody's like, yeah, you're doing great. Everybody's freaking out. And I say, praise God. And it's like, oh, Jesus, you're great. I love you, you're great. Weird. We're so exclamatory in everything but God, it seems. It's like, look what I got in the mail. I got this gift in the mail. Isn't it so amazing? Look what I got for Christmas. Look what I got for my birthday. Jesus saved you from eternal hell. Yes! Yes! Jesus saved me. I don't deserve it. He saved me. How? Why? Why do we just... Uh, yay. Or not say, I know that there's a somberness. I know there's a reality of it. I know we're not all extroverts and we all think, oh gosh, if I sing too loud, someone's going to hear how bad I sing and that's going to be really embarrassing. So what? Get over yourself. Praise God. Praise Him. Praise Him for all His works are wonderful. Praise Him for all of the joy that you can have in Him is eternal. Wow! Man, I could just do a whole other sermon on how wonderful it is to praise God and how we should. So let's praise God together in our prayers. And if you are really having a hard time, if you're saying, I, I want to praise you, but I just can't praise you. I feel like I'm, I'm so, I was doing that in the back. God, I want to, I want to praise you in this, in this word. I want to enjoy you, but I just know about my hidden life. I know about these things. So pray that God would help you to see that he is greater than your sin and that his grace is better than your sin and overcomes your sin and that you have hope in him. So pray that he would show that to you and then praise him for doing that. Don't hang on to that sin. Let it go because it already went on Jesus on the cross and move on into praise. Can we do that? Now I know that I'm going to stand out there and I don't want to force anyone to sing loud. It's not about that. Again, it's not about performance, so don't do it for me because I just preached and yelled at you for the last five minutes. Listen, find, ask God in your heart, God, help me to truly worship you in the way that you have designed me to do that. So let's pray. I'm going to pray. And then you can pray together, and then we're going to sing. Which is all worship. This is all worship. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you made me. I thank you that you created the people in this room. And that for those in this room who know you, God, I thank you so much that you brought them from death to life. I, God, want to rejoice this week in my salvation. I don't want to give in to the foolishness of following after a world that in the end can give me nothing. 
Help me to enjoy this world in a way that glorifies you. So when I go out today and I watch my kids play, that my joy is not ultimately in them, but is ultimately in you. When I, when I talk to people about you, when I, when I get to pray, and Lord, help me, help all of us to think we get to pray. The, the veil has been torn. The door has been opened. We can have communion with God. That's what we're doing right now with you, Father. You've made a way through Jesus Christ by the power of your Spirit for us to pray to an eternal God. That is not small. That is amazing and beyond all understanding. And so, Lord, I pray that even in our lack of understanding, our lack of knowing all these wonderful things about you, that you would still give us a fervor to praise you and worship you and rejoice in you. And that, on top of that, God, that you would give us also a desire to pray for the lost. Whether it's the Muslims or whether it's the Jews or whether it's, you know, we have so many different ethnicities in our city now. Lord, help us to pray for the lost. Because we cannot rejoice in the gospel while at the same time forgetting that wrath is on the earth. It's coming. So Lord, give us a somber joy in the reality of the gospel. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Help us to praise you in, the, in your name. Amen.